Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you who are here with us. Join us on the Jasper campus and those of you joining on our Logoti campus and those who might be watching this online uh, throughout the week. Uh, we welcome you to be a part of our worship and to be a part of this message. We're really uh, glad. Before I jump into what I'm preaching about today, I just want to say that next week in our Elements series, we're going to be bringing it to a close with a sermon about baptism, with a topic of baptism. We're covering elements, components of our worship. And we're going to make a special emphasis on baptism next week. And we really expect this to be a special Sunday. And I just want you to know, if you're someone who's been thinking about making that decision to say, hey, I want to follow Jesus, I want to be faithful to Him in the baptism, if you want to do that, then we would encourage you, uh, if you don't do it before then, and we by all means encourage you to do it before then, to make that a part of the services next week on both of our campuses. Uh, we'll be having Baptism Sunday. And if you've ever been a part of that when we've done those uh, at Redemption. It is a very special thing, and it's really awesome. So we'd like to encourage you to think about that. If that's an extra motivation to talk to us about it or do it, we'd love uh, for you to do it. It's a special, special thing, um, and it's that kind of that ceremony uh, coming together like marriage uh, would be with a couple of, of committing for a lifetime of following Jesus. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. If you want to talk about it, give us a, a, a holler this week and we'll talk about it. We're continuing our sermon series uh, today that we're calling Elements. And if you've been a part of it, it's simply what we're doing is we're looking at components or elements in our worship service that we do in our gatherings together. Now these aren't just things that we picked out because we like them or because they're fun. These are elements that we found in the New Testament church, the very first church in the book of Acts, as you read through it, you see that they modeled, they did these things within their gatherings, whether they were meeting in temple courts or in homes or wherever. You see these things that, are, that were present. Like the very first week we talked about song worship, singing uh, together. That was a very common thing in the early church and, and continues to be to this day. And in the second week we talked about communion, the Lord's Supper, and the importance it was placed in the early church and how we think that's really crucial uh, to our gathering together. And we'll do that in, in just a little while as well. And then last week Drew talked about corporate prayer, how we come together and pray together. And so that was a pretty uh, special week, I thought, last week as well. Now this week's topic is very interesting because we're doing a sermon on preaching. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, yeah, Daryl, this ought to be really awesome. You're preaching about preaching. You know, you talk about self-glorification, like holding up what you do above everything else. I mean, I, in fact, this last week I was traveling somewhere and somebody said, what are you preaching on this week? And I said, I'm preaching on preaching. And they looked at me. They thought I was telling a joke. They thought it was just a joke. But no, I'm legitimately preaching about preaching today. And let me tell you why. As you look through the Old Testament uh, there was a lot of prophets proclaiming, but when you get to the New Testament church, there's a lot of proclaiming of the Word of God or preaching. As early as Acts chapter 2, when the church was born, Luke wrote that the Christians were devoted to the apostles' teaching, which at least uh, has something to do with biblical preaching. And we've, we have several recorded sermons in the book of Acts from Peter, from Paul, from Stephen, from others. And actually, a lot of the New Testament, uh, scholars believe, came from recorded sermons. Sermons that people spoke before they was written down. And even before that, Jesus' ministry was marked by preaching. He would preach in the synagogue. He would preach in homes. He would preach on the water's edge. He preached on hillsides. A big part of his life was preaching. A big part of the New Testament church was preaching. It was a crucial part of their spiritual development. And it's not something that's extremely popular in modern day circles. You just don't hear a lot of places that like it. A lot of the gatherings, people just want it to be about singing songs and, and, and having a little devotion at the end, and, and they kind of downplow those. They want it to be more about the discussion, and a lot of people learn through discussion, and I don't want to downplay that at all, but what we see in the church, and what I believe is still crucial today, is there is something special and powerful and crucial that happens when the Word of God is opened up and proclaimed from the teacher of the Word of God. And we believe it is so important to do that you have it at each one of our weekend worship services. In fact, I would say it is one of the, what we put some of the most emphasis on because we're proclaiming the Holy Word of God. In fact, what is preaching, you might ask? Well, 
You know, the old feller said, here's a good sermon. You have a really good introduction and a really good conclusion, and you keep them as close together as possible, right? (laughs) Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) And that's what preaching is. No, preaching is, in fact, giving voice to God's, what God once said. It's giving voice to His Word with passion and urgency and authority. Preaching is sharing the heart of God with the heart of man. Or let me give you my definition of what I believe preaching is. Preaching is the prayed up, studied up communication of God's Word. And that's what I believe it is. That's a simple definition. If you're writing it down, you can write it down. I believe it's the the communicator studying and praying about the sermon topic, about the sermon passage, and then communicating that to the people. There's a well-known preacher uh, from uh, England named John Stott. He went on to be with the Lord, but he wrote a great preaching book called Between Two Worlds. Great title. And he said this about preaching. He said, you start on one side of the canyon, canyon with the Bible. And he said, on the other side of the canyon is man and this world. And he said, you don't just explain the Bible. That would be like shooting an arrow straight up in the air and it landing where it started. He said, what you do is you build a bridge across the canyon into people's lives and you lead them back across the bridge to the Bible and then you go back across into life and their life and you weave it back and forth until the knowledge of the Word of God becomes life. That is preaching. And that is why I believe preaching is one of the most valuable things that we could do when we gather together. It it is a point to just speak the Word of God into people's lives. John Stott also went on to say, churches live, grow, and flourish by God's Word, but they languish and perish without it. And one of the primary ways to get God's Word into people's lives is to preach it. So what I want to do for this morning is just give you some biblical reasons, and we're going to be looking a lot to 2 Timothy chapter 4 to to see some biblical reasons why we do what we do, why we preach. That's what we've been doing in this series. We've been looking at the Bible and seeing why we did it and what we do and, and how it affects our lives. And So I want to just start by telling you we preach because we are commanded to preach. We preach because we are commanded to preach. That's one of the main reasons I stand up here. I feel this, this, literally, I feel compelled to speak the word of God because God has entrusted the shepherds of the church to communicate the word of God to the flock. And we see this happening in the assemblies in the New Testament. We've seen it in all throughout the history of the church. In fact, the Apostle Paul was writing to a young preacher named Timothy, and he wrote a couple of letters to him. First Timothy was one of those letters. Second Timothy was the other one. And in the second Timothy chapter four, he said this, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who someday will judge the living and the dead when he comes uh, to set up his kingdom. Preach. The Word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Powerful words. In fact, the the way I learned those in the NIV when I was younger is, he says, Paul says, I charge you. In other words, this isn't a suggestion. I'm not hinting. I'm saying this is an order. Preach the Word of God of God and do it in season and out of season so what are we to preach we're to preach the word I'm not up here to give you personal opinions all the time I'm not up here to tell you what I think all the time I'm not up here to share politics and 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 that what's popular topics of the culture in the day I'm here to rightly divide to bring to you the word of God, to preach Christ, to preach Jesus, to preach Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected, to preach the gospel of grace. That's our charge. Now, for some of you who've been coming here for a while, you're like, why would you have to stress preach the word? I mean, that's what you preach, right? What other word would you preach? But I'm sorry to tell you, if you get out and you listen to sermons on the internet, or if you go visit other churches, a lot of times there are many churches that really don't put a lot of emphasis on preaching the Word. In fact, they sing a lot of songs, and at the end they have like a short devotion or some comments at the end of the service, and they give a, 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 a motivational TED Talk, and they let you go out, and, 
and, and, there, and sometimes sermons are all focused on making people feel good. Sometimes it's all focused on how-tos. Now, I want you to know something. When you preach the Word of God, you're going to do plenty of how-tos, and you're going to help people feel good at times. But I want to tell you, it's not our job to do those things. It's our job to preach the Word of God. To study it, to read it, to pray about it, and to communicate it in a way that speaks to your life. Now, ultimately, there are plenty of assemblies that don't do that. And people leave hungry. Have you ever went to a dinner party or, or, or to a party that you thought maybe was going to have food? The invitation seemed like it was going to have a lot of food. And you come there and you don't eat supper because you're going to this party where you think there's going to be food. And you get there and there's no real food. There's maybe just a couple of sweets and snacks and you're really, really hungry. And you're looking at your watch and you finally leave. And what do you do? You run straight to the drive through You drive straight into the drive through because you are starving. And I'm afraid that may be the case in many places of worship. And may that never be the case at redemption. I feel like Paul, when he said to the Corinthian church, Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe to me. Paul doesn't just charge us to preach the word of God, but he charges us to preach the word of God in season and out of season. Now he's not talking about times on the calendar, times in the year. He's talking about whether it's popular or well-received by the audience or whether it's not popular and not well-received by the audience. It doesn't matter. We preach the word no matter what. We do it in love, but we communicate God's word. Now I believe we have many in our audience, many in our midst who are hungry to hear it. They come longing to hear it. But I would be lying if I didn't realize in a congregation our size and, and, if, and in our world that's so pressured by ours that there's, not a, there's some people who don't really want to hear the Word of God except for where it lines up with their worldview or their lifestyle or their traditions. And they don't feel comfortable when it's preached in a different way. And certainly those outside these walls don't. Just this last week, uh, a friend of mine named Mike Baker, who preaches at a large church in Bloomington, Illinois, he preached a sermon um, on biblical sexuality. And he did it, and I, I, if you go listen to it, it was in as, as a loving and gentle and as grace-filled way as you could possibly approach that subject, but he stood on the Word of God. And if you were to read social media, read the newspaper articles and the television news stories about that particular service and about what happened there, you would think that Mike Baker was one of those guys marching with white hats on at Charlottesville. And that's the culture we live in. It's not in season sometimes. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, he went on here in verse 3, for times coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. And I think that's a season. And some of you are going to feel some pressure because we're going to always preach the truth and love. And sometimes you're going to go out and some of your friends aren't going to like it. But we preach the truth anyway. Paul says, I charge you. We are charged with preaching the whole counsel of God, popular or not. Now we're going to do it with grace and love, always. But we're going to stand on the truth. And I just want to make a promise to you. As long as I have a breath in me, and as long as I have a say in what we preach around here, we will always stand on the Word of God and preach it loud and clear in love and a truth in this church. Now people need to remember that we need to preach the truth in love because truth is not truth without love. But the other side, that's true too. Love is not love without truth. So we preach the truth of the word of God because we're compelled to. Secondly though, we preach the word of God because there is a power to change and grow the believer. In fact, good Bible teaching and preaching grows the believer as well as almost anything. A preacher and professor Mark Scott, not to be confused with the John Stott, Mark Scott said this. I love this quote. He said, few things are as impactful as when the church gathers in the name of God to hear the preaching of the word of God. 
to retell the story of the love of God and to leave dumbfounded by the mystery of God as they go out to do His will in a world en route to the new creation of God. That's what we want here. We want to preach the love of God, the mystery of the love of God, to retell the story of God so you leave so excited to live the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful. Hebrews chapter 4 says, for for the Word of God is living and active. It's not a history book. It has history in it. It's not a science book. It has science in it. It's not a facts book. It has facts in it. But it's a living, breathing Word from our Creator, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges is the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart there was so much power in preaching the word of god and i get to experience this all the time because there are times i stand up here and i fumble through my words and i muddle over pronunciations and 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 i think to myself boy that wasn't very good today and somebody will come up to the lobby and say you will never know how much that sermon blessed me That sermon blessed me so much today, you will never know, and I'll be like, you're right, I don't know how in the world that sermon blessed you. But I do know, because it's not me. It's not my stories. It's not my great oratory skills. It's the Word of God. It's powerful. In fact, Paul goes on the right here in verse 2, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Paul says, you preach the word to correct sin. In other words, to to point out an error. You preach the word to extort or exhort, not extort, exhort and encourage. You preach the word to build up some I believe biblical preaching does all of those things, even simultaneously. It's going to correct sin, it's going to point out error, but it's going to encourage and build up and inspire all in one. We're going to encourage people with... My goal is not for you to leave here beat up. I want you to leave here with a better understanding of who God is and what that means for your life. As preacher Tim Keller says, a good sermon is not like a club that beats upon the wheel, but like a sword that cuts to the heart. That's our goal. The New Testament makes it clear that that a combination of mind and heart, the relational and the emotional, can bring listeners to faith and obedience. Do you realize it's the combination? Sometimes we kick aside either the thought or we kick aside the emotion. God gave them all, and he knows when you bring them together, it will call the listener's faith to obedience. And so Paul says, listen, you preach the word. Effective Bible preaching feeds the church spiritually. It grows in maturity. And wherever there is great disunity, it will bring us back together. It will pull us back together and form a spiritual nourishment that is so powerful. And remember, our preaching here is about taking biblical context. In other words, we do context before content. In other words, we look and see what does the Bible say to the original hearer, to the original receiver of it, and then how does that apply to our lives? We call that application. We then apply what we've learned about what it originally was. Application is simply the intersection of the eternal truth of God with contemporary life. That's what it is. It's it's where the two meet And preaching is not just explaining a text, but explaining a text and engaging the heart. And that's my goal every week. I want you to get the so what of what we learned. I want you to see how the preaching applies to your life Monday, the same as it does on Sunday. I don't just want to give you good information. I want to funnel God's grace and give you transformation each week. Now, here's something that we don't talk about a lot. You play a part in the preaching. Do you realize that? It's not just about me, and it's not just about Drew or Corey or Richard. You know our role in the teaching, but you have a role as well. What what are some things you can do to truly turn up the notch in terms of receiving the Word of God? Well, I just want to share just a few things. First of all, you can be here as often as possible. I think we treat church attendance A little bit flippantly nowadays, where we just like, you know, I'll be there when it's convenient. If I'm not out too late on Saturday night or if I don't have somewhere to go too early on Sunday, I'll I'll be there. 
But that's not true in the Bible times. That's not true of the early church. They gathered together as many times as possible for fellowship, for learning the apostles' teaching, for praying, for coming together. There's something not just commanded, but useful in us coming together to encourage one another. And so I want to encourage you to be here as often as you possibly can. And if you can't be here, you're on vacation, find a place to be and go there. Another thing you can do is come ready. Now, I know what it's like because uh, sometimes we're running around late and, and we're rushing and we come in and we're just not really ready to worship. But I want to challenge you, just try to do the best you can to, to be ready to come. Don't make it a habit every Saturday night to be out late. It's going to happen from time to time. We have weddings and events and work. But as many times as we possible, come, rest up, be ready to come. Another thing that we can do is you can read ahead. Every week we send out the sermon topics and, so, and most of the time the passage that goes along with it. Read it. Prepare your hearts for it. Come not so starving that, you, that, that you're gobbling it up so fast that you can't tell you. Come uh, enough that you're going to be able to digest and hear the Word of God. Come ready. Participate in worship. We talked about it a few weeks ago. The more you give it out to God, the more you're going to be receptive to hear what He has to say. Come with an open heart. Be prepared to hear the message. Be prepared, be, be prepared to be a participant in the message. I probably should have you say more things to each other and talk to more each other in message because I think there's something about participation that happens. The, the great philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, ah, I messed that up again, uh, his name... Uh, uh, is always hard for me to say. I don't know why, but he's a very wise person. Listen to what he said. <laughs> People have an idea that the preacher is an actor on a stage, and they are the critics, blaming or praising him. What they don't know is that they are the actors on the stage. He, the preacher, is merely the prompter standing in the wings, reminding them of their lost line. That's rich, isn't it? Feed yourself. Serve. Don't just be a consumer. I, I like what uh, James says. He said, don't be just listeners of the word and deceive yourself, but be doers. L.D. Campbell was a great preacher, and, and he was, somebody complained to him that they wasn't being fed by his sermons. Listen to what he said. He said, well, take off the bib and put on an apron. <laughs> Sometimes we need to quit eating so much and serve. Do your part. One other thing that you can do is you could stand on the Word of God and back us up. You know, we're going to preach the truth and love, and sometimes your friends are not going to like it. In fact, some of the things we say, 90% of the people under a certain age aren't going to agree with it anymore. But you stand on it, and you back us up on it, and I promise you God will bless you for it. There's one more reason we preach. And that's that we preach to lead people to salvation. To lead people to Jesus. This is vital. We don't just preach just to encourage you believers and to equip you believers. Now I believe that's where I put a big part of the focus of my message. Because you have a lot of believers in your audience. And, and, and you need to feed them. This is the one chance I get every week to feed you all the word of God and, and I need to take you deeper and I don't need to spend all the time just focusing on the seeker those outside of Christ but here's the thing it is still through the foolishness of preaching that people are saved Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 since God in all his wisdom saw to it in the world would never know him through human wisdom he used our foolish preaching to save those who believe it's so so true. I fumble over my words and I mess up on names and I stumble through passages. But yet God uses preaching to draw people to Jesus and to save them. One of my favorite passages comes from uh, the book of Romans. Um, and listen to what it says. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Paul says, listen, anyone can be saved. All they got to do is believe in Jesus. 
But how can they believe in Jesus if they've not heard about Jesus? And how can they hear about Jesus if someone's not preaching? He also goes on to say, how can they have someone preach if they're not sent? So we need to be a sending church, and I think we are. But the truth of the matter is, there is something about preaching Jesus and his gospel that draws people. It's the only thing that draws people to Jesus. You can't do it on human wisdom. You only do it through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we believe around here that you've got to teach on a lot of subjects of the Bible. There's not just one subject. It's not just the gospel that we teach on. But every subject we teach on needs to make a beeline for the cross back to the gospel. No matter what it is. If we're preaching on marriage, if we're preaching on, on uh, uh, money, whatever it is, you grab that text, you expound it, but you make a beeline for the cross of Jesus Christ because the gospel is the only thing that saves. It's the power. I like what Tim Keller says when he says, you need to follow this progression. He says, here's what we must do. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to teach you, here's what we must do. But here's why you can't do it. And here's the one who did it for you. And here's how in faith through him, he enables you to do it. You get what he's saying here? He's saying, you say, here's what we must do. But you can't do it. Here's the one who did it for you. And now here's who, through him, you can do it better. You see what's happening here? You are saved by the one who did it for you. But then he empowers you. He strengthens you. He inspires you. He fills you up so that you can live better for him. You can become a better follower of him. You see, we preach the gospel not just so people will come to salvation, but also so those of us who've come to salvation will be reminded of the power of the gospel and be equipped and filled up in life to go out and do it even better, even more. So maybe this last point shouldn't have been we preach to lead people to salvation. It should say we preach to lead people to Jesus. Because if you are already saved and you come to Jesus, you're going to be filled up and go out. And if you're not saved and you come to Jesus, you're going to be saved and filled up and go out. And so over and over and over again, we make it about Jesus. And we unapologetically preach Jesus, 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 and his gospel over and over and over again. Because it's the power that saves us. And it's the power that empowers and strengthens as well. You know that old hymn, I love to tell the story. One verse says, I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Because every time we're reminded of the gospel, we're reminded of how much God loves us. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. So we can live for him. And I'm continually amazed. I get because of the influence of what God's done in this church to preach all over the place. I'll get to preach, a guest preach at a church in Fort Wayne, Indiana next weekend. And I I get to hear the responses. I get to see people who've been saved come forward in tears about what God spoke to them about that day. And then I get to see people come forward who've never accepted Jesus say, I want to follow him. Every week it affects both the saved and the unsaved. There's power in preaching the word in season and out of season. So, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can he call on the name of the one he has not believed in? And how can he believe in the one whom he has not heard? And how can he hear without someone preaching to him? And you know what? That preaching, this doesn't come from the platform. It comes from you as well in everyday life. And I don't mean standing on the corner with a bullhorn. I mean preaching with your words and your deeds and giving people a daily encounter with Jesus that will leave them not unchanged. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the power of your word and thank you that you use even a unwell spoken hick from French Lake. Lord, to speak because the power is not in me, it's in you. Lord, this is all I've really ever wanted to do. And I'm so thankful that you've allowed me to do it each and every week. But I'm thankful that I don't do it on my power, but on the power of Jesus. And we celebrate that every Lord's Day when we remember that Jesus took our place and the punishment we deserve 
to give us the reward of heaven that we don't. That he broke himself and shed his blood for us so that we could live in him, for him. Through Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thou art, how great thou art.